it sounds silly to say it's one of my favorite things to talk about because it's like the inner critic isn't um we'll talk more about you know it's like it's not a sun shiny <laughs> but you know I, I just I, I the more we understand something and this is actually a, a, you know not our usual way of understanding things the more we understand uh the ways that we get tripped up or you know um the more we understand what gets in the way of our essential wholeness and enoughness and okayness, the more we can connect with our essential wholeness, enoughness and okayness. So glad to see you, Edna and Ruth and Alan and Warren and, um, and uh, Julie, the animal communicator in Maryland. So glad you're here. I'll keep letting folks in. Uh, and, uh, and we'll just take a moment as is um, our, um, practice inside of our sangha here to connect just taking a second to arrive and to connect with the inner terrain and i say arrive because if we don't take a moment to acclimate to what's happening here and now and recognize that something is beginning and something is ending. We're not really setting ourselves up to receive, you know, what it is that we're here to receive. Closing any back doors, there's no burden that you're carrying right now that needs to be entertained. Notice that our burdens are, are almost always, <laughs> right, not here. Though they may be in our bodies, like in pain. So that's like the, the pain body, you know, feeling pain in our body is a burden that um, doesn't stay static. It actually shifts and changes. And so we can just, you know, sense into from this place of like devotion to being here and now. We can sense into what, what it is that we're here to receive. What's your intention? It could be for uh, connection or ease or peace. There might be a very specific thing that drew you to this meditation and Dharma talk on um, the inner critic and how we find freedom from it. We'll take a nice deep breath in. And if you like, we can bow. And as we flutter our eyes open, taking in your space, orienting. Oh, I slept on my neck weird. <laughs> it's like hard for me to turn my head. Um, yeah, and then we'll orient to each other. I'm gonna go get my bell. I realized I didn't have it on my altar. your intention or and anything you're noticing about how you're doing in the chat. And um, I want to mention here that we go about 50 to 55 minutes. Uh, roughly the first half of our time together is a, a teaching, you know, I just talk about uh, different aspects of the Dharma and Buddhist psychology and depth psychology and uh, somatic, you know, like yoga, you know, uh, somatic. I take a lot from somatic experiencing too. And um, yeah, we just, we look at that lens first. We understand something uh, through a conceptual lens 
But as I talk, I, ex I just invite you to soften and relax. Let this be a space where you don't have to like get anything or try to be someone you're not. You'll get whatever you're here to get. Yeah, you know, it's like part of when we're under the thumb of the inner critic, we try really hard. It's never good enough. Yeah, so um, let me just go into the chat. Let yourself just receive what it is that you're here to receive, but also refrain from multitasking, refrain from doing all those things that are so hard not to do when you're not, in, when we're not in a, like a physical space together, which is why it can be nice to put yourself on camera. <laughs> You know, and it's totally fine if you don't, but um, if you are someone who struggles with that, like I do, um, when I do Zoom stuff, it's good to just put yourself on camera, you know, and I'll do that because <laughs> I know myself, you know, and I got my phone, but I got this, you know, and um, so, you know, just set yourself up so that you can really be um, like nourished here. I want us to think of these times when we come together on Tuesdays as, as that, like, you know, it is, it's a, a time to be fed and nourished. And, you know, for me, there's nothing that feeds and nourishes me like practice and the Dharma. You know, I could just geek out on this stuff all day long, but it, it's true though afterwards, you know, I, I, I feel more supported. So let yourself receive that here. Um, we do spend about the second half of our time together in a guided meditation practice. So with that, let us dive in. First, I want to read your intentions. Ruth, I am gradually feeling more present as I sit here. Isn't that interesting? Feeling grateful, Marilyn. My intention is to pause for practice and compassion. Good. Yeah, I love how you take care of your practice. All of you, you know. Lauren. Hi, everyone. Welcome, Lauren. <laughs> I'm glad to be here looking for some support, love, just having a hard day. Yes, you've come to the right place, my dear. Welcome, welcome. I just met Lauren um, through the Thriving Healer. Alan, continually fighting with imposter syndrome. Oh, yeah, baby, that's like a that's a flavor, right, of um, the inner critic. So, so glad you're here. Reminding myself I'm getting in my own way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think this is like today's talk too will be a good reminder because I think like this never gets old. You know how I always say that? The breath never gets old. Uh, being in your body never gets old. And I say that because, and then talking or uh, bringing awareness to this um, insidious voice in, 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 in us, never gets old. It's so easy to forget. And, you know, she sounds like truth or he sounds or they sound like truth, which is why it's so good for us to come together and talk about it so we can, um, through the seeing, you know, through the insight we have, it can help us like, it actually helps us, um, it helps it shift, you know, dissolve in some ways, but then it re-emerges, <laughs> it re-erects itself. And so um, practice doesn't get old. Um, we will continually be coming together and exploring this terrain together and realizing that, um, you know, it pops up in new and different ways, like in my own practice, for sure. And when I fall asleep to this aspect of myself, to this aspect of you, um, we can really take it impersonally because there's not a human with this, you know, with us, it comes with the psyche. It comes if you have a body and, you, you know, which we all have, we're all in a body, then we have an inner critic. How tamed it is right, is about practice. And, you know, you can think of like a stallion or a horse or, you know, or I mean, I think of like a wild animal and how it can be like really, I mean, if it's, if it like, uh, you know, if it might be really dirty and smelly and, and pissed and like, not, I mean, a wild animal, like a 
like a, um, you know what I mean? <laughs> like feral, you know, like if you've ever had a feral cat, they're just like, they're wild. And they're, you know, sometimes when you first get them, they're stinky and they're busted up and they're mad or they're, you know, <sighs> they have a lot of trauma. Julie knows all about this. Um, and so that's like your inner critic. I really want us to start to orient. That's like the first, before I even unpack more here, we get to understand that this is a part of our, um, it is a part of our sense of self, kind of our psychological development. Uh, it was, it, it comes about pretty early in our childhood development. There's a great book called Embracing the Inner Critic. Notice the wording, embracing the inner critic. It's like, eh, I don't want to embrace that smelly, <laughs> feral, you know, but that's see it, it. So we don't like this part of ourselves. There's like, and part of, part of that comes with not seeing it, you know, either it's all, I'll get more into this, but it's just an acclimating and, and sort of uh, inclining towards this relationship of friendliness. You don't have to like your inner critic. No one likes Nellie Olson, <laughs> right? In the, in the email I said, um, I hope you, I, <laughs> that, was, that was fun <laughs> thinking about Nellie Olson um, from Little House on the Prairie, yeah. <laughs> um, no one likes her, you know what I mean? Um, and she's, right? Got her reasons for being a pain in the ass. And your inner critic, our inner critics, a lot, I just have gone on unchecked for a really long time. They have not been cared for. They have not been tended to. They have not been listened to. And there's no fault here, no blame. It's, you know, and so it's particularly wily and wild and needs taming, needs taming. There's no getting rid of it. It is an aspect of who we are and, you know, I probably, um, I don't know, it's probably a much more popular thing to say that I have some magic, something that can get rid of us. <laughs> but something the Dharma is, is it's honest, I think, right? It's really honest and it's not, it's not the information, it's not the quick fix, but it's truth. Right. And some of us are like, yeah, that's what I want. And that's why I'm here for you. <laughs> it's not going away. But it's this like process and practice of bringing awareness to it um, opens the door to how to work with it. So I need to bring my notes up. This is a poem from Dana Falls. It's called judgment. <laughs> Release the harsh and pointed inner voice. It's just a throwback to the past and holds no truth about this moment. Let go of self-judgment, the old learned ways of beating yourself up for each imagined inadequacy. Allow the dialogue within the mind to grow friendlier and quiet. Shift out of inner criticism and life suddenly looks very different. I can say this only because I make the choice a hundred times a day to release the voice that refuses to acknowledge the real me. I can say this only because I make the choice a hundred times a day to release the voice that refuses to acknowledge the real me. What's needed here isn't more prodding toward perfection, but intimacy, seeing clearly and embracing what I see. Love, not judgment, sows the seeds of tranquility and change. I make the choice a hundred times a day. It's so good for us to all just together remember that this is a choice we make a hundred times a day. 
practicing with this aspect of ourselves. It's day, it's on the daily. And I'll be honest, I mean, there's lots of days when the past when I forget. And then she runs the show. I don't just feel like a fake, right? But I'm avoiding things because I'm believing it, right? I can really relate to imposter syndrome in that way. <clears throat> and you, you know, I'm sure you can too. Oh, 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 can't, can't forget to admit people, Karina. Good job. Okay. Um, so the, let's talk about and, and I, you know, the imposter syndrome is one facet of the inner critic. The inner critic's unpinnable. I just, I, I, I think it's so nice to remember that because it seems as we talk about it, like this crystallized kind of thing, this thing that, but actually, um, it's it's not pinnable, and we can all take a breath maybe with that. But there's, there's kind, they're, they're just like um, uh, when we're sick, right? There's symptoms. There's symptoms of being under the inner critic's influence. And I think that being aware of the symptoms is like, is, is, is really important. It's part of the medicine. And I'm gonna talk about the medicine um, towards the end. Um, and right now we're just talking about understanding this thing we call inner critic. It's, you know, it's part of trauma, developmental trauma. And something I'm noticing in my work, because I work with spirit, I work with practitioners, I work with yogis, I work with people who have been like on a personal growth path for a long time. So, you know, oh, no audio. Are you not getting sound? Are you hearing me, you guys? Yes, we are. You have when you first join, you have to unmute yourself. It's in the bottom left corner. Oh, okay. Yeah, but I, I you can hear me though now because I was just looking at someone in the chat. Yeah. No, okay. Karina, we can hear you. I'm saying I think Amanda needs to enable her own audio. Oh, oh, oh! Thank you, thank you. Yes, Amanda, you heard that. Enable your own your audio. Yes, Edna, I see you had a hand up. Um, I hope it's okay if, if I take that question. I will take that question um, at the end of the talk. I was saying, I work with a lot of people who have, you know, like me, you've been doing this for a while. And it's like, I'm not hard on myself. There's this aversion almost to even us just like copying to it. Because somehow, if we have a good spiritual practice, we we shouldn't be doubting ourselves anymore, or something like that. Um, I, I just want to bring that up. Something I'm noticing, and I'm like, actually, like this isn't something you get as you practice more and you like understand the inner critic more. Like part of part of being a good person now is that you don't have like this going on for your, you, right? It's it's I don't know how better to say that, but there seems to be some shame. This is a better way of saying it. There seems to be some shame when we're noticing maybe that the inner critic is operating or just shame around even, you know, saying that, um, uh, you know, I'm hard on myself and it's painful. Um, it is part of trauma. Um, but it's, it's also attributed to like every person human, but I think the intensity of it is more for folks who have been missed in different ways in childhood growing up, right? So, um, someone like, but still, you know, <laughs> I don't know of a human being who doesn't have, um, have a, an inner critic. But I, I think it's important for us to sense that it, it, it was a protective mechanism. You know, and this is also how it relates to trauma. It's like, 
oh my gosh, the places where we felt judged when we were growing up, um, the inner critic developed as a way to fix you. So you could be Shirley Temple when I was growing up. <laughs> you know, I thought, oh God, if I could just be Shirley Temple, <laughs> right? My dad would really love me. You know, I mean, I, I see that now looking back, right? And it's like, that's impossible. I'm not Shirley Temple, I'm Karina, you know? And so there's this setup. And now the inner critic is, you know, at different points trying to make us be who it believes we need to be to avoid being hurt, right? To avoid even just being judged right? Hence, you don't know what you're talking about. Hence, like, no one's going to hire you. So like, you know, why even put yourself out there and like, blah, 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 blah. Um, in the Buddhist teachings, this inner critical narrative may be understood as the hindrances of greed, aversion, and doubt. So, this is a good, you know, I just want to mention, we have a Dharma talk and meditation on YouTube. If you're not a subscriber on YouTube, get, subscribe there. You'll get these uh, replays because um, when I find a good Dharma talk that really resonates with me, I'll listen to it multiple times. And you probably are like that too. There's one on hindrances there. Um, but greed, aversion, and doubt, those are the hindrances that we can relate to um, the inner critic. And this is sort of the intersection of the dharma and psychology here. Um, the practices for working with greed, aversion, and doubt are very helpful, very good medicine for the inner critic. I'm not going to talk more about those hindrances because, um, but look at that video if you want to explore those more. So the inner critic, right? There's what the inner critic says and then there's discernment, just the truth. And sometimes it can be confusing. Like we don't want to delude ourselves, right? We don't want to like, we don't want to um, put our head in the sand, right? And so denial and our fear of being in denial is <laughs> that's one that's like a good trick of the inner critic too. Like I always think about the sense of urgency um, whenever I feel urgent um, about something uh, that I need to change or need to do. That's a really good indication that I'm caught in some kind of fear, and probably this is related to. Um, yeah, it's related to something that isn't love, something that's that's question. It's some it's suspect. It's suspect. So it feels crappy when we're under its thumb. Urgency is one one aspect of it. And it's a way that we can kind of discern, we can sense the difference between just truth, like you know, the truth you need to hear, but like. It doesn't, you're not like stoked to hear it, but you know it's true and it's like, okay, yes. And then there's the you're a piece of, you know what, just in general. That's related to core shame. And that's the voice of the inner critic. You're a, you're a broken person. You are inadequate, fundamentally flawed. Like there's nothing that can be done. And this keeps you from being, you know, like everybody else. Discernment from the days when I used to drink. Wake up in the morning. I don't feel well. There's a part of me that knows. And when you drink a lot, like you kind of have a lot of these. Um, there's a part of you that knows when you like, it's like, oh, ooh right? But then the denial kicks in because you don't want to cop to that truth that you don't feel well because you drank too much. And then there's like this insight that, wow, there's been kind of a pattern of this. 
And that's discernment. Judgment. You're never going to get your act together. You're just like your mom. If anyone knew this about you, right, they would, they would know who you really were and they wouldn't love you anymore. You're disgusting. I can't believe you did that again. You're disgusting. That's, that's poison. It's poison and we take it when we're not aware. That it's like this, it's like, it's, it's insidious. It tells you you're like disgusting sometimes, especially I think with addiction, it gets really, really, really mean. And part of addiction, what's woven into that is this really harsh and pointed inner voice. You do something and it's not the thing that's wrong or bad or whatever. You drink, you have this pattern and it's making you feel bad physically. It's taking its toll. That's right. It takes it and it just makes you the like just the scum of the earth. It's an add on. It's mixed with self-doubt and self-denigration. And one of the medicines that we use to work with, oh, and let me tie this. So, and the reason it's so freaking mean is because of just how long it's gone unchecked. I mean, I think this should be taught in every elementary school. Wouldn't that be cool? <sighs> Right, there was like time to talk, like, and just to talk, like, bring it out to the open because then, you know, it's like nip it in the bud because it, it's it, 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 right? It just goes unchecked and it's behind our, like, I have a client who has such a hard time just giving herself the rest that she needs. You know, because the moment she rests, the inner critic's like, you got to keep going. You got to like protect, you got to like build, you got to be fixing, working on yourself all the time, all the time. You can't drop the self-improvement project ever. So we, we, part of the medicine is like what we're doing here, bringing the voice more to the forefront of our awareness. This is a quote from Tricycle. Most of us are so used to this voice, we don't even notice when it starts talking. We just assume it is us unnecessary. Sometimes you might even think of it as a coach or guide, motivating your best impulses and pointing you toward new goals. This voice may seem to coach you toward better things, but it attempts to motivate you by putting you down through its disparagements. And that has the opposite effect. We feel undermined and discouraged. And, and I, that's the end of the quote. And I think that's a lot of the personal development industry, which is like part of my, my rub with it is that shame is used to like inspire change. But what shame does is sell. It doesn't inspire change over time, right? When that thing that made you feel so good falls away because you're human and you, whatever, you fall off the diet, you fall off the thing, you stop whatever it is and you, you know, you feel like you've just failed miserably as a human. That's not love. That's not what we're talking about here. And over time, this inner critic has a residue, right? That builds up. I think there's some good, there's a lot of good things. This is what I was saying before about like the personal, personal growth and all that. But if you feel like yuck 
like bad about yourself, like really bad. Like when I really looked at my drinking, I had, I felt bad about myself because I was causing a lot of harm. And that was a necessary feeling of like, I didn't feel like I was horrible. I just was like, Ooh, like, uh, I don't want to do that. I don't want to keep causing harm. Um, you know, but we want to be, you know, mindful of, of, how change is being, you know, pushed or not pushed. Like Carl Rogers said, I think, it was only when I didn't feel like I had to change that I felt free to change. But there's a lot from the industry that is good. So it's like, just trust yourself, right? When you're, whenever you're listening to a talk or going to a seminar or anything like that. Um, and be wary of being shamed like leave the room <laughs> that's happening I've been doing a lot of these things um core shame and its relationship to yeah we went through that so let's talk about the medicine and then we'll practice so um and I'm just going to explicitly say some things that I've I've pointed to um up to now first of all we, we get to get that we need medicine it's really important to remember that we do need medicine um, because uh, the wounding that we suffer from collectively is uh, tied to, right, like that just default, like, I mean, it goes so deep and it's so thick, this inner criticism and that voice of the inner critic and how it influences us and how we feel about ourselves and how we feel about each other. Um, awareness is the most like essential aspect of medicine. And it's a new way of listening because it's awareness not tied to judgment. What we're all doing right now is like normalizing the terrain. And you might just notice something about how you're feeling. Maybe you feel a little bit more freed up inside. I don't know, maybe not. You might just notice how it is to just bring a little bit more awareness to this um, unpindownable aspect of our experience that we call inner critic. And a new way of listening, just um, rather than going into denial or going into um, just owning it, like it's truth collapsing. We're seeking to have a, we're seeking to have more of a um, hospitable relationship. Come in. Ooh, it looks like it's been a while since you've had a shower. <laughs> I know I haven't let you in before. Because you're really, 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 really mean and hurt me when I'm believing you. But I get that you're, you know, I get that you're hurt and I get that, you know, you just want, want to, you know, be part of my heart. And um, I don't, you know, I don't know how this is going to go, but I'm open. <laughs> Let's start with a shower. <laughs> right? Let's start with the shower. Um, it's the courage and the trust to stay with our wild inner worlds. I just gave you a little, little story time around that, you know, this like way we can relate to this aspect of ourselves that um, is often running the show. Or we're rebelling against it. There's nothing to rebel against. You know, a lot of people talk to me about their sabotaging or their rebellion. And I'm like, oh, right. It's like, oh, but what are we rebelling against? We're rebelling against the should. We're rebelling against the inner critic, either our own or what we're seeing out there. Um, 
more medicine is trusting in our natural conscientiousness that arises when we're just here and present. I invited you all at the very beginning into this trusting and natural conscientiousness, just closing the browsers, being fully here, but being relaxed, not trying to understand anything, just trusting that it will, you know, what you're here to receive will land. And imagine if we could like carry those moments of a natural conscientiousness that we cultivate here together in our Sangha, right? Into more moments of our day, right? Life would be a lot more easeful, probably. I know it is for me when I'm practicing in that way. Like it's okay to let go. Body awareness is really important. As I said, this is unpin downable. It's really more of a felt sense thing that we give voice to later. What is this voice saying to you? You know, it's like what we can ask, like, what is this feeling, right? Saying about you or about life. And it's like, you're a loser. I'm so bad. You know, shame is deeply tied to this. So when we, Think about body awareness. It's a, it's, we can think about um, this awareness, this openness to not feeling great emotionally. When it arises, I'm open to feeling like the sting <laughs> of a, a text message, right? Because that's might be what happens if I get one and my, you know, and I, I, I get afraid and then my inner critic kicks in and judges me for something. I have to be open to that ouch moment and then explore from there. And how do we know if it's true? One last little piece here around the medicine when we get confused, is this like something I should be listening to or not? Is it kind? Is it kind? Like, honey, oops, <laughs> I know you really want to be like the best mom you can be. Like, I know that's deep in your heart, right? And this is getting in the way of that, this habit you have. Is it kind, right? Or is it shaming? You are disgusting. It's a really good, simple, simple way to know if, if that voice is coming from love or not, is it kind? All right, let's sit. Long talk today. Um, yeah. Edna, did you still have, are you still here? Did you have a, did you still have your question? We'll make ourselves comfortable. Oh, Amanda, thank you, everyone. What a great group. Oh, I'm looking in the comments. Oh, good. <laughs> you got audio. Yay. Thank you, Sangha, too, for helping out folks like who are new um, to our gathering. We're so glad you're here. Um, yeah, so let's uh, let's sit together. These talks are, um, and these meditations are freely, freely offered and your donation really makes a big difference. Um, so uh, you're always free, please welcome to come. And um, if you can make a donation, that's awesome. I really thank you for those of you who make your regular donations, Venmo, PayPal, or Zelle. There were going to be um, taking some of these different medicines together as practice. And we bring more awareness to our bodies. We let the talk go. Just let it go. No need to think about it, though thoughts about it may arise.
tune into your natural breath. And it's nice as we begin the sit to take a few deep breaths. So we'll hold at the top of this inhale, deep breath in. Good, sip in a little bit more and hold. And let it go. And again, deep breath in. Hold, sip in a little bit more. And let it go. One more like that. Just let your breath be natural now. Just for now, we can let our bodies be at ease. You might find five or 10% more ease available with that invitation. Let your awareness, we'll let our awareness just effortlessly sort of sink. Taking some moments to inhabit our bodies. to feel how our breath is moving our body. As we soften face and throat and chest. The spine is naturally strong. We're staying with the feeling of breathing. Across or in the body. It's resting with it. It's really okay not to be like making meaning of our lives right now. It's really okay not to be sorting everything out. We're sort of gaming out how we measure up or even what to do next. just to be here with the breath and the body, to trust this, to trust this more than the urge 
to sort out our life. If you get distracted and pulled away, it's by that urge, it's okay. Really just come back, re-relax into this kind of more spacious sense of the body breathing. You're welcome to stay with this, just sort of sitting practice. Stillness practice, being in the body, in the body of ease, and returning to the body of ease. Or you can um, explore this terrain that I'll introduce now. It's good for us to just be honest and just kind of clear or about pain of believing this voice that has us constantly preparing, trying to get it perfect. trying to make you perfect. Busy avoiding the other shoe from dropping. Looking and just, yeah, reflecting on how this kind of lives in your body. This is inquiry, so there's no right answer. Just notice what arises as I ask the question, how the inner critic lives in your body. Maybe how it keeps you from living a more enjoyable life, how it keeps you in fear. And 
maybe as we're just opening up this inquiry, there's an image you have of this aspect of yourself. Notice an image if one arises. Maybe this aspect of yourself, you know, even has a name. I have a friend who calls hers Gary. Maybe hers is Nellie or Philomena. Harold. How is it to listen to this aspect of yourself in this way as we just bring this part of ourselves into um, the forefront a little bit more? You might find that you feel sad or it makes you kind of laugh. But there's a way in which it changes maybe. The relationship a bit with this aspect of ourselves that so often feels like truth. Take a deep breath in and exhale. Just letting that go, that inquiry go. Now, just taking this one in, what, what does your inner Gary or Nellie most need? Think of how it runs your life sometimes. How afraid it is. how it's trying to keep you safe in the only way it's ever known. What does it most need? And then letting that go. Bringing a hand now to our chest. However you did that, by the way, you did it perfectly. However that went for you, those inquiries, you did just right. We're letting it go now. going to offer some words of kindness, some words of metta to you. And I want you to sense them like coming to you, letting them in. And they're not just coming to you. They're coming to that, that inner, that inner one. that inner critic too. Let both aspects receive. May you be at ease. May you be at peace. 
May you feel safe and free from inner and outer harm. May you be truly and deeply happy. May you be healthy. May you have a feeling of well being that isn't bound by circumstances or conditions. May you be at ease and may you be at peace. May you feel safe and free from inner and outer harm. May you be truly and deeply happy and healthy. May you have a feeling of well being that isn't bound by circumstances or conditions. Thanks for sitting with us and with me. Um, we do this every Tuesday and we'll be back next week, Tuesday. If you love, if you, you know, receive something here, come back uh, 10 a.m. PT on Tuesday. Um, mention in the chat, any takeaways? I have my, uh, if you're in the area, Long Beach, uh, California, um, I have my Insight day-long meditation retreat coming up on June um, 5th. I have a few spots left, so um, just a few. If you're on the fence, let me know. Um, there's a link on my website to sign up for that. And um, vegan lunch is provided. And uh, it's really good medicine for your inner critic. <sighs> to steep yourself in a day of this, in a day of this like life giving, that's how I, I experience these teachings. They like give me life. Um, that there's an opportunity there. If you'd like me to zoom you in, we can do that too. And just email me. Um, and we register, we'll register you a different way. I can relate to the urgency. Yes, Ruth. Can always become a better person, change, yeah, good way, yeah, Edna. I have to control everything. If I don't, I won't know what will happen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good, good, Ruth. Anytime you're feeling urgent, Right, it's good for you to know that that's the belief that's operating. I have to control everything. If I don't, I won't know what will happen. It's not about not feeling urgent. It's about tying that feeling when it arises to that belief, right? Getting that that's what's in operation. And then you can apply medicine. Good, Lauren, thank you, Karina. Feeling much more peace. Oh, good. I have a love-hate relationship with the anxiety. I know, right? I do too. Um, book that's really great, Make Peace With Your Mind by Mark Coleman around this. Great article on Tricycle. If you just go into Tricycle, uh, search Inner Critic. There's a recent one done in 2022. Um, Diana Falls wrote the poem that I, I led with. It's called Judgment. Thank you, Amanda. Thanks for helping. All right, I'll see you back. If you love this, invite a friend and be well until I see you next time.